Welcome back again to the Ivory Tower Collections. This is the uh, beginning of part two in my uh, basic tutorial on the MT or the Roland MT200. In this particular video for part two, I'm going to focus primarily on two additional features that I didn't really touch upon in the first video that were in the diagnostics and test menu. And that was the ability to set the clock on the MT200 as well as the uh, functions with the diskette itself. Now, actually with the diskette drive mechanism, uh, I'll be covering things like how to format the disc and uh, song copying and things of that sort. So anyway, let's get started. In order to set the time on the Roland MT200, you have to do that from the diagnostic mode. And as you may recall from my last video, the method that you use to access that is you have to hold down, and I know I'm going to be covering this up and you can't see it, but uh, I'll uh, mention it in the video description below. But you have to hold down the repeat key, the song key, and the play button as you power on the module. And you'll know that you're ready to go when you're sitting on the T-1 showing you the firmware version. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my forward and back buttons along the bottom until I get to option number T-3, which is for the clock. Now, the clock functions are controlled as far as setting it and adjusting it. They're actually controlled through the secondary panel up here on top of the module itself. So let me go ahead and hit play. And this will show me the current date and time on the module. And you can get really specific on setting this. I mean, you can adjust this all the way to synchronizing it to the second. It's, it's crazy. So let's talk about a few things. Obviously, it shows us the date, current date. It shows us the day of the week. And it also shows us the uh, current time. The time is in 24-hour format. So that's really the only option you have. So according to this, it is currently February 27th of 2018. It is a Tuesday, and it is 6.23, almost 6.24 p.m. And that's, that's pretty close. It might be a little bit off on mine. I'm sure I wasn't that accurate. But here's how you change the, uh, the settings. So for starters, if, if the time is accurate already and you just want to synchronize it to the second, then if you use the blue song button here, it will actually reset the seconds that are currently counting down back to zero. And I don't know if you saw that when I pushed it, so I'll do it here in a second. I'm going to push the song button and you'll see the seconds start back to zero on the current minute. Just like that. So that's how you can synchronize it by the second. But if you need to make other adjustments, that is all done primarily up here through the front panel. And it's laid out pretty easily. It's not marked, so I kind of had to discover this by accident. But here's basically how it works. The top row of buttons is to move an option up, or change a number up, rather. And the bottom row of buttons is to go down. And then reading them from the columns over, the uh, chain play and shift keys are to adjust the year. The metro beat and cut keys are used to adjust the month. Sound and copy are used to adjust the day of the month. The write and paste buttons are used to adjust the hour. The record mode and play stop button up here is used to adjust the minutes. And then finally, the MIDI and save buttons are used to adjust the seconds. Now to adjust the day of the week, you actually use the left and right arrow keys uh, located here. You'll see that as I push them, I can uh, specify whatever day of the week I need to. So if I needed to change the year for whatever reason, I can just push this uh, chain play button up or push the shift button down to go back. Same thing as I said before, Metro Beat and Cut will change the month. So I'm just going to move around like that, day, and change the hour, the minutes, and again I can change the seconds. And that's pretty much it. That's how you set the date and time on the Roland MT200. Now you might be wondering why the time matters or why it's uh, even important to even know how to do this. Well, obviously the unit will still function regardless of what the date and time readings might be. And, and it's really not critical for that. But if you are a musician and you do use this unit to compose music with, then you're going to want to make sure that the recordings that you use on the disk drive 
uh, have the correct date and time stamps on them because of course the system will date and uh, put the time on your files and that's all determined based on the unit's actual date and time. The other reason to know about this is if you ever have to change the battery in these, and yes, there is a coin cell battery inside of these modules, um, that battery is to store current configuration settings that you may have in place, as well as to maintain the time and date on the module. But if you ever change out that battery, that information will get wiped out, and you would have to reset it. And so that's why this process exists. So in the next video, I will go through some of the more advanced disk functions and uh, see you back. Now let's talk a little bit more about some of the more advanced uses of the disk drive itself. Now the disk drive, as I had mentioned previously in the other videos, is a standard PC 3.5 inch diskette drive capable of reading both double density 720 kilobyte diskettes as well as high density 1.44 megabyte diskettes. And uh, the manual does recommend the use of the 1.44 megabyte diskettes, which they claim it, it actually writes and is able to read from them quicker. I would think you'd want to use it just because it can hold more data. So in any event, so the disk drive itself, it's used obviously for mostly to record music that you produce through the sequencing of the module. But it can also be used to play back music that you have recorded. And again, it can play back basically three different types of files. Now I've mentioned in my videos before really only two of them, but I'll, I'll go back into it again. So it can play files that you have maybe in the standard MIDI format, and it can play type zero and supposedly some type one files. But I will say that I've had some interesting challenges with type one files. They don't always work. And the manual even tells you as much. It says that technically it's really only supported for type 0 MIDI files. So if you have a MIDI file that doesn't work properly, maybe it gives you an error message when you try to read it. Chances are it's probably a type 1 file with some sort of parameter or something in place it doesn't understand and you might need to convert it. The other type of file that it can read are files that contain songs in the RSC and RSD format which are the files that are created natively whenever you record through the module itself and save onto diskette drive, or onto the diskette rather. And uh, those are not able to be read by standard MIDI software in most cases, and would also require a type of conversion. My understanding is that because the RSC, RSD files are a Roland proprietary type file format, that pretty much only the Roland Music Tutor uh, or, ver or a visual tutor software has the ability to convert those files and turn them into standard MIDI files. I have found another conversion that has both an online converter as well as an offline converter. You can download and run through a command prompt, but it hasn't been too successful at converting some of the songs and they end up coming out more messed up than if I just record them and leave them in their native RSD, RSC format on the uh, diskette. The other kind of file uh, were those that were sold through music stores and things of that sort, and they're called ISM files. Basically, those files are more used for teaching purposes. They're essentially standard MIDI files with a few other features of interaction and are designed, again, for teaching, for learning piano, things of that sort. And again, those are more specialized. So the primary ones that people would be using would be to play back standard MIDI files as well as anything they've recorded from the module itself. So that's the disk drive right there. One of the things I will notice or, or mention is that the disk drive light, it's kind of hard to see in the video, but it is always lit. If the unit is powered on, the disk drive light is always lit. However, when it's reading data, you'll see it blink brighter whenever it is actually in use. So that's normal for the disk for the diskette drive light to always be on. So let's talk about the diskette. To use a diskette, you're going to have to first format the diskette. Now again, it's a standard IBM diskette, so you can actually format it either through your computer or you could format it through the module itself, which is kind of handy. Now the module can auto-detect which kind of diskette type you're using, and uh, if there's any problems with the diskette, it usually is pretty good about identifying that and telling you that a certain diskette may not be usable. So how do we access the diskette functions? and prepare a diskette. Well, again, you have to open up the secondary uh, panel on top, and because the disk button is a secondary function, you have to hold the shift key as you push, push the disk key. It now says disk song copy. We also have the option to do an all song copy. 
a song deletion, and then disk format. So I have a sample diskette here that I'm going to put in to do the format process. Now this diskette is not very, it's not a good diskette, so it usually fails the format process, but for the purposes of this demonstration, it will serve our needs in showing you how the process works. So again, I have it in disk format mode. When I put a diskette into the drive, uh, I'm going to need to use the enter key here, which you can see it blinking. You should be able to see it blinking on the video. I'm going to push the enter key. It's going to know that there's a disk in, this, in the drive and it's going to say clear disk data. Is that okay? All I have to do is hit the enter key again and it will start the countdown for formatting and preparing the diskette. Now regardless of whether it's a 720K or a 1.44 meg diskette or double density, high density, it basically takes the same amount of time. The countdown timer always starts at 80 and counts down to zero. And we'll see here, I think here in a little bit it might fail. There we go. Like I said, this disk gets bad, so it does tell me that the disk write error formatting failed. And that's fine. I knew it would. But you get the idea of how you would format the diskette for use. Okay. So, let me back out of this. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to the disk options again by pushing shift disk. And that takes us to song copy. So, song copy and all song copy. Well, they basically sound exactly what they said. Song copy allows you to take music that is on a disc that perhaps you've already played back through the module and then allows you to make a copy of it either to a different diskette or you could make changes to the music and perhaps you know change different instruments or the tempo or, or whatever it might be and then you can save it onto the same diskette either with the same file name or with a completely different song file name. And so the, disc, the song copy allows you to do that. The all song copy is basically a disc copy itself. It makes an entire copy of the entire song diskette you currently have inserted and allows you to put it to a destination diskette to make a copy. Now I do want to mention that this copy option only works on diskettes that contain the RSD RSC file format. It does not work with diskettes that contain standard MIDI files. It will actually give you an error message when you try to use it that says diskette contains SMD or it says SMD data disk cannot copy. So really that's the only way that, it's, uh, that it can be used. So I'll show you an example of how the copy process works here. And we're back again. So I want to show you something real quick. I now have a song data disk in here that has some recorded songs in the RSD RSC format. So what I'm going to show you is first I'm going to show you how to uh, play back a disk that contains song data so you understand how that works. And then I'll show you how I'm going to make a modification to it and I'm going to save it as something else. I'm also going to delete a song that I might have on here um, just to make room for it or what have you. Okay, so first let's talk about how to play back song files. The basic rules of the playback for this is the same whether it's using the uh, RSD, RSC native file format or if it contains standard MIDI files. The basic process is the same. So when you insert a disk into the module, it'll be able to recognize it. It will usually read it and immediately show you what the first track of music is that's available to play. And then from there, if you want to listen to that current song, all you have to do is hit the play button to do so, and you'll hear it play here. And then you just have to push the stop button when you're done listening to the current song. Now, Whenever you're playing back a song, it'll actually count down your progress using the measure section here. Every song is counted down in measures, and then how many measures or how many notes are in a measure is also determined by the beat. In this case, this is a standard 4-4 uh, beat. You also have the tempo <clears throat> displayed here. Anytime you're playing back a song through the module itself, you actually have the ability to adjust the tempo. So to get there, you're going to use the little left and right arrow keys to navigate to the tempo section here. Notice that the little arrow is pointing to the tempo, which is currently set to 120 beats per minute. Now, I'm going to play the song again, and this time I'm going to adjust the tempo up to its proper speed.
There we are. You may have seen that I was using the alpha dial encoder wheel to adjust my tempo on the fly. If I want to reset the song that I'm currently listening to, perhaps to hear the whole thing again in the proper tempo, use the reset button here, which will take it back to the first measure, and uh, then you only have, all you have to do is hit the play key. Now you have to be careful, because whatever mode that you were left on here, for instance I was adjusting the tempo, the arrow will stay there. So if I were to accidentally bump the encoder wheel, it would actually change the tempo. So to avoid that, just make sure to hit the blue, the blue button for the song button to kind of take it back up here. You l run less risk of uh, changing any options while you're playing back music. So now I can play it back from the beginning with the proper tempo. And there we go. You get the basic idea. Okay, so we heard the song the first time and it was at the wrong tempo. So what would I need to do if maybe I wanted to record it with this right proper tempo? Well, I already have it set in place at 190 beats per minute. Now what I want to do is I want to save this song back to the diskette but with the right tempo in place. If I just use the save button here, it's going to immediately come up and say please wait and then it says, says save sure. It's asking me if I want to confirm saving the song. Now what'll happen is it's gonna save what we currently have loaded with the changes made back to the diskette on the same file and same song. So basically it's going to overwrite the original song. So I will hit enter on that to confirm. It does take a little while. This is older technology, it's not going to be as fast as our flash drives and SSD hard drives that we have today. Additionally, this song is actually really long and there's a lot of data there, so it takes, it takes some time to copy. <clears throat> so alternatively, if I wanted to save this under a different file name, what I could do is use the shift key and then push the save button, which then gives me the option to use the save as feature instead. And the save as would allow me to save the song as a different song track entirely with even a different title if I really wanted to on the same diskette. Okay, so now it's done. I'm gonna pop the diskette back out. And then I'm going to pop it back in. Actually, I'm gonna set it to make it think there's a new song that kind of resets everything on the front panel back to 120 for my tempo, et cetera. I'm gonna pop the diskette back in again. It sees the original song, and we'll see if it kept my tempo changes. It may not have, but hopefully it did. Let's see. Nope, looks like it's still slow. Well, that figures. I probably should add, I would probably need to adjust that within a MIDI sequencing software itself. But you get the idea of what the save is for. So let's choose a different song this time. And this one plays back at the right tempo. But let's say that I make a change and I want to save this one onto the same diskette, but I don't want to overwrite the original. Well, here's how you go about it. First, I'll play a little bit of it to make sure that I get the song loaded into the memory of the module. Okay, for those that are familiar with the video game circles, I'm sure you'll be able to recognize what that song is from. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I want to save that song as a different song title, but I don't wanna overwrite the original. And this is where the shift and save button now turns into the save as. Now what will happen is it'll first default with the original title and the original song number. But if I want it to be a different song number, all I have to do is use the encoder wheel here and change it to the next number up. In this case, it's now a three. Now, if I just hit the enter button to confirm, it would actually save the exact same title as song number three. So in essence, I would have two copies of the same song. If I need to use a different title, all I need to do is use the left and right arrow keys to drop down to where the title's listed. And I'm sure you can see in the camera, but I currently have a blinking cursor underlining the letter B. If I need to change that letter, all I need to do is use the encoder wheel to scroll through the alphabet, 
like so. Okay, if you don't want a letter there, if you want to generate a space, just keep going backwards or uh, counterclockwise until it has nothing. And you can do that with basically all of them. Now, the encoder wheel will allow you to specify alpha numbers. So you can do, or I'm sorry, you can do alpha, you can do numbers, and you can do some special characters. And you can do both upper and lower case. It's entirely up to you. It's just, you just have to scroll through the appropriate option you want as you use the wheel. I tend to just stick with uppercase and I don't tend to use any special characters. It's just quicker, a little easier if I'm using the module for that. So let's just change the title to this one and let's just call it O Tears. So once I have the title in place that I want, all I have to do is hit the enter key and it will then save that music data as track number three call with the song title of O Tears. And I do not have to have the cursor at the end. I can basically have it anywhere I want as long as I've got the title that I want in place within the character limitation that I can basically see on the screen. And I don't remember what it is right offhand, but it's not very many. So you are kind of limited on your titles. So I'll go ahead and hit enter. Again, it's going to confirm if I'm sure I want to save. So I'll hit enter a second time. And now it's going to save uh, song two under a different name as song three, but I will still have the original song two in my menu list. And I'll be able to show you that when I scroll through the titles. Doo -doo -doo. There we go. So now we are at song three called O Tears. If I use the encoder wheel to scroll counterclockwise, it'll go to song title two called Bloody Tears. And then if I scroll counterclockwise again, oops, I went too far, it'll take me back to the first song on the list, which was Wicked Child. Uh, if I scroll back further than that, it will go to a new song, which essentially will now, anything that goes through the MIDI module is now being tracked as a new song instead of one of the others. And same thing, if I scroll forward past the three, it also takes me back to new song as well. So that's the basic functions of how you save a song that you have loaded into the module onto a diskette. But what if I want to delete a song? Well, that's not too difficult. What All you have to do is just have the diskette in place. This time, you're gonna hold the shift and hit the disk button again, which takes us to our options, like for song copying. And this time, I'm going to choose the option to do song deletion. It's the one just before disk format, so be careful with that. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit enter, and it's now going to list the titles of the songs. And again, just use the encoder wheel to specify which song I wish to delete. I'll delete the one that I just made a copy of, the one called O Tears, as song number three. I'll push the enter key to confirm that that is my selection. And it'll once again want a confirmation, am I sure I wish to delete? I will hit enter again. And it will now delete song three from the diskette. And that's, uh, that's basically the operation of the disk button for making copies of songs or entire diskettes, as well as deleting songs and also formatting the songs. And then also that is how you use the save function buttons for saving songs recorded in the module to diskette. With those basic, basic disk functions out of the way, let's talk about how to play, uh, just like songs off of a standard diskette or a diskette that you might have standard MIDI files on. And again, I mentioned this before, but you really need to try to stick with type zero MIDI files. Um, here's what I have found regarding MIDI Type 1, and, and there is a difference between them. MIDI Type 1 files have the ability to have additional effects, for the most part, added to them. Additionally, MIDI Type 1 files can have other data on them. You can actually add text, like lyrics, for karaoke use. Believe it or not, they do make karaoke MIDI files. Um, yeah, so that is something that, that's possible. What I have found with MIDI 1 files that seems to work best for me is you have to make sure that the file only contains 16 actual tracks. It doesn't matter if you have 16 tracks with instruments and a seventh, excuse me, and a 17th that contains text only, only have 16 tracks. So, if you have a MIDI type 1 that's got more than 16 actual channels and tracks on it, 
delete any of them that do not have any actual instruments and notes assigned to them. That will make it easier for the module to recognize what's going on. The second thing is that the resolution of the file, which basically dictates how many notes in a single measure it's really capable of keeping track of, needs to be at a certain level. And you can go up to some really crazy levels on that. This module really is only designed to handle up to 120, uh, I want to say it's called uh, notes per quarter or, or PPQ. I'm not sure what the def or what that abbreviation is for, but they, the song needs to be at a resolution of 120 PPQ. So if it has more than that, try reducing it. If it has less than that, try increasing it, but keep it at 120. It might alter the number of notes in a particular measure of a song, so your mileage will vary whenever you change that information. Alternatively, there are conversions out there. A lot of MIDI sequencers will allow you to convert type 1 to type 0 files. So you can also give that a try as well. But do keep in mind that when you do that kind of a conversion, it could alter some of the characteristics of the song and it may not sound as correct. So with that in mind, let's play a few songs. I have a couple of uh, MIDI files on here. And in fact, I believe I even have a type 1 on here that does work. So I'm going to put this diskette in, and just like the Roland disk, or the disk that contained the native RSD, RSC files, this reads instantly and tells me what the first title is. This song happens to be a Type 1 file, not because it says 1 down here in measure, but just because I know personally it's a Type 1 file. So when you have a standard MIDI disk in place, and the RSCs work the same way, you can do a couple of different things with the functions here. Obviously, if you use the play button, it will play back the current song selected. Stop will stop it, but it doesn't like permanently stop it. Think of stop as both a stop and as a pause button, because if you stop playback in the middle of a song, if you hit the play button again, it'll pick up where it left off. The record button is used just for that. It's designed to record whatever you may be sending to the module through the MIDI input port, either from another keyboard or a separate controller. The backwards and forwards buttons are used to advance or go back measures of a song. So you could think of them as your fast forward and rewind. The left and right arrows up here navigate between the number of beats per measure or the type of beat, like you know if it's three fourths or if it's four four, as well as adjusting the tempo, which again you can also adjust on the fly during playback. That's kind of fun to play with sometimes. Uh, let's see, the enter key is used to transpose, so you can, during playback, change the current octave of a song, so you can make it sound higher pitched or lower pitched. And then the buttons here marked R1, 2, 3, and 4 are the individual track indicators, or track buttons. R is usually for rhythm, so when you're playing back a standard MIDI file, in most, most cases, R translates usually to channel 10, which is where the drums are usually played. So if you wanted to listen to a song without the drums, you could hit this R button during playback and the drums would disappear. Same thing with other melodies and counter melodies and bass lines. If they're, you can simply hit an appropriate button here to basically drop those sets of voices off and you can hear just a specific part of the music. So let's demonstrate some of this. Let's go ahead and play a song and I'll kind of go through and, and change some of this around. Let me find something good to play. Well, that'll work. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play on this song here. <clears throat> Obviously we can hear it playing back. If I want to take the drums off, I can hit the R button. So now it's just playing the, the instrumentation, just the melodies and counter melodies and bass line. Sounds kind of funny though, doesn't it? taken the melody off. Now we just have the bass line, counter melodies, and, and uh, drums. Now we just have just our very basic bass line and the drums. That's pretty much all we have right now. There's our, there's our counter melody. <laughs> so you get the idea. That's how you use those. If I want to go forward a measure, I can just hit the forward button. And as you can see, it skips ahead. Back goes backwards. If I hit the reset button, 
it'll actually stop the music playback and go back to the very first measure. So the reset button will completely stop the playback as well. But think of this as your total begin or total go back to the beginning type button. Okay, so that's how you play one song at a time. You simply select it and hit the play button. But what if you wanted to play multiple songs? What if you wanted to play all the songs in order, like a jukebox, on the disc? Well, open the top panel button and use the button here marked Chain Play. Now what this will do is when you have a disc loaded and you have the first song ready to go, and it doesn't have to be the first song, it can be any song, but whatever song is currently highlighted or available to select from, as soon as you hit Chain Play, it will begin playback of that exact song, and then when that song ends, it'll automatically begin playback of the next song in sequence. So unfortunately, I haven't really found a way to set up like a playlist or to tell it to only play songs one, three, and five, for instance. It's pretty much just plays them in order from whichever one you have selected as the first. So I'll hit Chain Play, and you'll hear it begin to play Big Earl. So you get the idea there. And although I didn't let it continue, if it when, it when it had gotten to the end of the song, it would have advanced to the next track. So that's pretty much all there is to talk about in regards to setting the clock and the more advanced disc functions and playback of the module. Um, that's really all I'm gonna cover in part two. I realize this is much shorter than the first one. But uh, that's okay, I wanted to make sure I covered these in detail. So in the third part, I'm going to uh, attempt to video document the process I went through on how I got this module to work with my Windows 10 computer using a USB to MIDI cable interface uh, and allows the module to actually take over and play MIDI sounds not only when playing MIDI files through Windows using a MIDI player but also through emulators such as DOSBox and Scum VM where I can select it as a general MIDI device and sound canvas for games that support it for enhanced music playback of those older games. So. That one will probably take me a little while, but uh, be sure to come back and join me whenever I've got that one ready for you. And uh, thanks again for watching. Appreciate it.